Superintendent uh, at Howick South and Pakaranga congregations. Um, thank you very much for coming along to this uh, uh, interview where I hope to be able to draw uh, the two of you out on aspects of Wesleyan spirituality that really interest you and excite you. Um, so maybe let's just begin with a very brief summary. Um, I'll put it to you first of all, Terry. Are there th uh, could you give us, say, three aspects of Wesley and the spirituality that um, capture your imagination. Mm. Thank you, David. Well, I, I'd begin by saying that um, Wesley developed a theology of God's grace, and um, it's really a foundation of Wesley's approach to Christian faith and understanding to say that the grace of God is at work in every life. There's, there's no person for whom the grace of God isn't a continuing experience. And Wesley wanted to help people to come to the point of understanding where they could say, yes, um, these promptings within my life uh, are the result of the Spirit of God at work. So it's that, that prevenient grace at work in every life. And then I think I'd want to say that for Wesley, um, the inner revolution that the Holy Spirit brought uh, was very important. Um, the heart of religion for Wesley was the religion of the heart. And um, once the heart was engaged by the grace of God, then a transformation was, was begun. And, and this is the third thing, I think, that Wesley would say, that <clears throat> as a result of the growth of the person who's had this inner experience, then there would be um, effects in their life. The fruits of the Spirit would be uh, discernible. And so that their relationships would develop um, grace would be evident in, in their working uh, life, in their families, and in the wider society. So I think that that's what I'd want to say, those three things. Thank you, Terry. Um, how about you, Trevor? What, what are the main aspects of Wesleyan spirituality that grab you? I would choose three topics briefly. Uh, Armenianism, by which we mean the fact that all people can be saved, all people have a need of God, and there are none outside the orbit of God's care or the reach of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That the gospel can be shared and should be shared with all. Uh, the second one would be the concept of the religion of the heart to which Terry's already alluded. The idea that feeling, passion in religion still has a part to play. That we can trust our religious intuitions and feelings. I think that's an important aspect of, of the faith. And uh, lastly, Wesley's concept of connectionalism. Not just in the way in which he tried to build the church in terms of its interdependence of being one big family, one big organisation. All right, subdivided in certain ways at the local and district level, but certainly one big family is symbolised by the conference where it met annually. Uh, but also in the aspect of connectionalism in making connections between many varied aspects of what was for them the beginnings of a modern, complex industrial society. Well, I, I think that uh, John Wesley uh, lived in an age where there were so many different things going on. Uh, there was the scientific revolution, there was the industrial revolution, there was the move away from the agricultural economy. Um, Trevor, you, you see the, the expression of uh, Methodist connectionalism as somehow linking these uh, other influences from society? Yes, I think so, because Wesley was able to keep an open mind to what was going on in the world around him. In wanting to safeguard the priority of religious feeling in an age of scepticism, of the Enlightenment, of rationalistic mm. thought processes, where it became out of favour by and large to go in for passionate, enthusiastic religion, uh, because it was seen as the passions overriding uh, human intellect and reason and leading to religious warfare and despotism. Uh, but Wes was able to hold on to, to that 
despite what was going on in the philosophical realm. Likewise, uh, Wesley didn't therefore turn away from the modern world. He was still able to embrace it in terms of his uh, dispensary, his interest in uh, the latest scientific uh, processes, his interest in, in electricity, his dissemination of the latest sort of works of, uh, of good reading for his Methodist people to have access to good books. He was certainly very interested in promoting the cause of literacy, uh, both uh, for, for children and for adults. Um, Terry, do you have any comment about this uh, uh, linking of uh, the, the context of his time uh, to, to this heartwarming experience? Uh, that I think you called it um, disturbance somewhere or other in uh, your essay. Yes. Well, I suppose that the preaching of the grace of God to every person, <clears throat> and that the grace of God reaches out to everyone without exception. Um, Wesley latched on to right at the very beginning, and, and as Trevor has said, this Arminian uh, view meant that he was in conflict with the Calvinists. Um, but I think that there were quite revolutionary implications in Wesley and Wesley's embracing Arminianism, uh, because England in the 18th century was a class society. Um, class structure meant very much to everyone. They were, um, they knew their place and um, and, and were kept in it. Uh, yes, yes, and and it, it suited um, people in the upper classes to um, to understand class as being quite um, defining of the way society was. But once you begin to preach a message of the grace of God, that each and every person is loved. Um, by God and known by God and valued by God, then this is implicitly uh, undermining and subverting the class system, which which really relied uh, on um, social strata and rank, and uh, and there were people who were, were were part of the society that made the decisions, and there were other people who received the decisions. Wesley's theology of grace. Um, had implications in terms of undermining that and asking questions about the way society was arranged. Well, well in that sense then, it would be a very powerful uh, tool uh, for undermining if you're saying that no one is excluded mm -hmm. from this thing that we call the, the, the love of God, uh, the, the, kingdom. the kingdom of God. Uh, and uh, I wonder whether you can see any parallels uh, uh, in the church today. Uh, uh, do, do you see... Um, Methodism in, in our context, in our terra in New Zealand, as being um, in any way exclusive? Would you see it as an inclusive church? Uh, how, would, how would you go about uh, applying that Wesleyan concept to the church today? Mm. I think the church is uh, in New Zealand is struggling with these notions of inclusivity and exclusivity. And I think that um, it's very important that we hold on to this foundational insight of Wesley that the grace of God is available to all and that God is wanting to be in relationship with each and every person. And so I think um, in a society um, where there is increasing social differentiation, um, the message of, of Wesley is um, very important, maybe increasingly important, because those on the margins uh, are often forgotten uh, by our society. Well, would you see a role uh, for for particularly the presbyters, that is the ministers of the Methodist Church, uh, to be standing alongside of those people on the margins? Yeah, I think this is where the um, prophetic dimension of Methodism, with its concern for social justice, uh, uh, has, a, has a role to play. I think certainly in the area of the bicultural journey, the church has uh, attempted to take the theology of grace and and to apply it to the relationships between Pakia and Māori, and uh, we've still got a lot of work to do in that area. But I think this has been an area where we've we've attempted to apply our Wesleyan insights. Mm, thank you for that, um, Trevor. Uh, you you have a concern for um, uh, you've expressed for uh, connectionalism uh, as being a, an expression of that dynamic that uh, John Wesley had that could hold together many different things um, within the family, as it were, and you see that as particularly important. Um, would you like to draw that out for us? It's just my sense that 
society is assailed by two main movements at the moment in terms of how we live from a day-to-day -day basis. On the one hand, there's the pressure of globalization, which is putting all humanity into homogenous sort of units of being consumers in a great industrial consumer machine. And rightfully, people are beginning to sort of rebel against that and see how it causes great harm at the local level when we're all forced into this macro system whatever. You mean sort of like the McDonald's as uh, the same and... Uh, the McDonaldization uh, uh, of the world, yes. you know. Yeah. There's a price to pay for that sort of efficiency, that sort of dependability uh, of, of a market share and profitability and, and, and job security and all those things, some of which are very positive, but it also does a, a great deal of harm too because it symbolises the way in which individuality uh, and locality are being sort of expunged in the before this crushing power of the commercial industrial machine in these multinational businesses. So, so uh, John Wesley's understanding of being in connection wasn't like a, a central bureaucratic control such as you might find within a, a multinational organisation. It was something more dynamic. It was, it was about being in connection not only uh, with congregations or societies, uh, but all, also being in connection through the power of the Spirit? Indeed, and that is, that's that aspect of what I want to come on to is the, the second part of that explanation, in that it's, we've got to be honest that Weza could be a real autocrat at times, and uh, there are times when he resented even having the conference around him because they might sort of uh, cross him in some way and want to go in a slightly different direction. So, yeah, there's the touch of, of the power politics and the megalomania within the way Wesley had uh, the vision of how he was going to organise this Methodist movement. Because he was a driven man, he had a vision, and uh, he, he, he had this sort of urgency to get on with the task. And sometimes he just felt that people were sort of dragging their heels a bit uh, in terms of, of following where he wanted to lead. So there is that aspect that is perhaps slightly unsavoury today of how Wesley wanted to hold on to power so tightly. But there is a very positive aspect to Wesley's connectionalism, and I think it's this. In modern society, we seem to be suffering from the, uh, a rampant individualism, whereby we're falling out of relationship with people. Uh, it's not so long ago that in Britain, the Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher talked about, you know, there is no sh such thing as society. And sadly, that's becoming ever more true. We don't know our next door neighbour. We don't know the people across the street. Uh, even within the family unit, we're having our meals at separate times in front of television sets in separate rooms uh, or at the computer screen. And what Wesley's concept was in connectionalism was that we're all in this together. We're part of common humanity. We're, yes, we're, we're part of this family grouping and we have obligations to each other. So when you became a Methodist, you not only joined the church, the movement, the local society, you were also put into a class meeting whereby you're expected to meet for a deeper conversation of Christian fellowship where you discussed personal growth and personal responsibility within the life of your growing Christian commitment. And it's that aspect that is the good side of what I mean by the connectionism of John Wesley, that he wanted to hold people together in relationship. And I think that that is very much at risk in the modern world. Uh, we have the powerful going their own way, and other countries or individuals can tag along if they wish to, but the decision is, is being made autocratically in several centres in the world. I think that's also true in the light of the church increasingly, that we're, we're falling out of true relationship, and I think that's a great danger, and Wesley has got something to say about that. Yes, uh, it seems to me that in the, uh, in the modern day Methodist church, uh, the, the church in which we try to minister in various ways, we, we are in danger of over-regulating ourselves, uh, of having uh, relatively uh, large power concentrated in a few hands. Uh, uh, all of those things uh, have been uh, in, our, in our, the thoughts, in the horizon of our thoughts, but we've never been able to tackle them. And I wonder whether the answer to tackling them isn't somehow to do with uh, reclaiming Wesleyan spirituality. Now, 
uh, Wesleyan spirituality has a capacity to enlarge our vision. Uh, that's the title of the book that the two of you have written, Enlarging, Enlarging the World Through Wesleyan yeah. Spirituality. Uh, what about the, the role of good humour along with good grace in this, Terry? Well, um, I guess Wesley was a very serious man, and he could be described as being earnest. And um, some people have criticised him for a lack of joy and humour, and, and I think there's probably valid criticism in that regard. Um, Dr. Samuel Johnson, who wrote the uh, English Dictionary in the middle of the 18th century, enjoyed conversations with Wesley. He felt that they had uh, some things in common, and, and uh, he wanted to spend longer with Wesley, but Wesley would give him 20 minutes, and then he'd be off in a very purposeful manner to some uh, engagement that he had. Um, and um, Johnson was exasperated by this, because he thought there was more to life than, than uh, time management. Um, and certainly Wesley set up a school uh, for the children of his travelling preachers and there was no play in the curriculum. Very little time for the children to relax. And uh, I've looked in, in the writings of Wesley for re to references to, to sport. And uh, while there would have been cricket at the time, uh, he doesn't seem to say anything much about it. Oh, that's, that's rather interesting, <coughs> isn't it? Uh, and uh, uh, yeah. uh, there is this uh, slightly uh, puritanical street, oh, yes. to, uh, streak to his yes. ze zeal yes. for, for reformation yeah. of society and church. I suppose the only arts that were exercised uh, within Methodism were the arts of poetry. And uh, um, Charles Wesley was the one who, uh, who wrote the, the wonderful poetry that uh, was set to music. And, and in, in the worship, there would have been uh, the experience of joy, um, but um, in the chapels that were built, um, we, you, they couldn't have been described as being beautiful or having artistic merit. And Wesley was very dubious about art. Um, he didn't like the theatre. He, uh, he had all sorts of questions about um, the, the finer arts, really. Um, because, because they got in the way? Yes, or, or they probably seduced people away from the um, prayer and uh, the, the earnest life. Mm. Do, do, do you think, uh, Trevor, that there is a, a place for um, spontaneous joy in Christian worship? I think that Wesley struggled with keeping down enthusiasm when he saw it, uh, because it was there within the very heart of Methodism, as Terry's already said. It was about his own warmed heart experience. And he was sharing that sense of joy in rediscovering the, the power and joy of the Holy Spirit. Admittedly, he wanted to do it in a very regulated fashion in many ways. He was very much a, a prayerful person. But his, his preaching alone, the spontaneity of, of deep conversations as he went down the road and got into conversation about deep theological matters with people that were going the same way on the road to Reading or wherever, there was this sense that joy kept popping up out of places. So when he heard of people falling over in the power of the Holy Spirit, speaking in tongues, and some of the more, uh, what he would have termed outlandish manifestations of the joys of the Spirit, Wesley was rather dubious about all this. Uh, but he found that it was in Methodism anyway. And uh, he, he wanted to keep it to the, the singing of the hymns. But it just bubbled out of early Methodist meetings anyway. He was earnest because he was uh, intent on saving souls, wasn't he? Yes. Uh, and that was, that was the primary task of his preachers, uh, uh, to save souls and in, uh, to bring people to that experience of Christ for themselves, which might then issue forth in other kinds of good works. Uh, social action, we, we would call it today. Um, but the primary emphasis in the early Method Methodist movement was on saving a soul from uh, itself. Fleeing from the wrath to come, I think, is one of the standard sermons. Um, so there is a little bit of hellfire and damnation in uh, Wesleyan spirituality. Uh, but isn't it true that he also said that everyone could be saved. There's, there's a famous aphorism. Would you like to remind me of it? Well, <laughs> it's, it's um, all people need to be saved. All can be saved. Uh, 
all need to be saved, and all can know that they are saved to the uttermost. <clears throat> I'm not sure I got the order quite right. But um, it, it was this sense that um, there can be an assurance that the Holy Spirit is at work within us, and that, that we are somehow safe and held in the grace of God. And then he went on to this question about perfection, which um, Wesley struggled with in his teaching, and was uh, criticized to a considerable extent about the possibility of perfection in this life. But Wesley clarified it um, and later drew um, at the definition, definition more clearly by saying that to be perfect is to walk, walk in the spirit, um, to walk in the light, and, and to be completely dedicated uh, to uh, the kingdom of God. Terry, uh, uh, on this question of um experience, uh, which I think is absolutely essential to Wesleyan spirituality, uh, he would have encouraged everyone to claim something of the Christ experience for themselves, the, the, uh, the movement of the Spirit. Now, uh, I, I would, for myself, I would want to claim that, um, but I'd want to claim it in a variety of ways uh, over a number of years. So there is a development of spirituality. Yeah. Do, do, I, as we sort of draw things to a close, do you see spirituality developing in a Wesleyan sense? Oh, yes. Yes, I think that, that the Wesleyan um, proclamation has been taken to all parts of the globe um, by an amazing missionary endeavor. And it's become expressed in different ways in different places. Um, and I'd want to hold to um, the validity of the core experience that, that Wesley proclaimed. And I'd want to put it in terms today of, of our being disturbed. I think to be spiritually dead, um, we could just say that a person is unable to be disturbed by uh, something that's happening to their neighbor uh, that's causing pain. or they can't be disturbed in terms of um, the need for compassion. Um, now I think that uh, the, the Holy Spirit works in people's lives in many different ways, but it's this basic disturbance and causing a dissatisfaction within the heart so that a person can say that um, my life can be richer and deeper uh, because of um, my um, awareness of the grace of God working within. And I think that's as valid today as it ever was in Wesley's time. So the, there has been that development uh, uh, that uh, it actually has expanded, I think, and because the richness of life has been expanded yep, as yep. well. I, th I think the, the question of perfection, you know, that Wesley taught about the possibility of reaching perfection, and we want to put it in different ways. But um, <clears throat> he said that um, gr life was growth and development toward a perfection. And if we put it in terms of a process, I think it's far more healthy. And when I'm aware that my own life is far from perfect, and that I can grow in grace and understanding of faith, then I think there's, there's not a, a long step for me to say, ah yes, and when I look around, our society is imperfect, and that there's, there's work and a mission to be engaged in there. So the church has a validity for today, yeah. both in the personal and yeah. in the corporate sense. Yes, in terms of the transformation of my heart within and the transformation of the heart of society. Thank you, Terry. I think we can see a modern man secular manifestation of these needs also around us. For example, this need to be aware of a presence that is beyond oneself, a spiritual dimension to life, something that is so deep that it is self-transcending. That quest for authentic religious experience is being found in all sorts of substitute ways in terms of what is it that these people are looking for in their use of drugs? What is it they're trying to take themselves out of? Uh, I, I think that people are finding it in all sorts of ways like that. Or some of these new age movements, that they're looking, searching for some sort of spiritual dimension that shows there's something beyond this life that is beyond the, the palpable reality around them, beyond the, the bottom line of the balance sheet that so dominates our lives nowadays. So I think we've got that. We've also, with regard to the spiritual growth and holiness of, of, of Wesleyanism, 
uh, whole bookshelves in most of our bookstores now of self-help manuals and self-growth, you know, steps towards success, steps towards enlightenment. And they're coming from all sorts of different, you know, psychological, new age, uh, uh, counselling sort of backgrounds. But they are but modern, secular manifestations of what Wesley was about in the spiritual faith. He was saying, yes, human beings do need to have a religion, a sense of self, that brings them to the conclusion that they are precious and unique and part of something that is eternal and transcendent. And life needs to have a dynamic of movement and growth in order for true human fulfillment. And therefore, I'm still confident that Methodism has something to offer even in the modern age. Thank you for that, Trevor. And uh, I'd like to say uh, uh, to both of you, I wish you success with the uh, book uh, Enlarging the World, Wesleyan Spirituality Today, and I hope that uh, people in the connection are able to enjoy the uh, AMECB resources that we're putting together. Thanks. Thank you, Thank you David.